So if you are just attending for the first time, this is our uh, WordPress accessibility meetup. We're going to be talking about basic accessibility testing. I have a few announcements to go through and then we will get started. Um, I always like to start by letting everyone know that we do have a Facebook group that you can join if you are interested in connecting between meetups. If you go on Facebook and you just search WordPress accessibility, then you will find the Facebook group and it's a good place to um, ask questions or get help or share things you're working on in between meetups. If you are interested in finding out about other events that are coming up, or if you want to get the recording of this, this is a question that we always get. Uh, this meetup is being recorded. It will be available in about two weeks once we have corrected captions and a full transcript available for it. And we will post that on our website. You can find it by going to equalizedigital.com slash meetup. The best way to get notified of upcoming events and um, to find the recordings is to join our email list. You can find that if you go to equalizedigital.com slash focus dash state. It should also theoretically, if I've done things right, uh, pop up on your screen as a thank you message after you leave the meetup. Um, but if you join the email list, you'll get emails twice a month with upcoming events, links to the past recording, some other news and information for accessibility and WordPress. Um, we do rely on sponsors for the meetup to help us cover the cost of live captioning. Uh, we are hoping that we can offer sign language interpretation again in the future. So if your company might be interested in sponsoring the meetup, please reach out to myself or Paula. You can also email us at meetup at equalizedigital.com to get information about sponsorship. I am Amber Hines. If you aren't familiar with me, my company is Equalize Digital. We run a, uh, we have a accessibility auditing plugin that helps you find some of the problems that can be found with an automated tool uh, on WordPress sites and puts reports on the post edit screen. We also do accessibility auditing and um, consulting, and that was sort of what led us to create the meetup because we wanted to have more opportunities to learn and connect with other people in the space. So that's who we are. If you want to learn more about us, you can go to equalizedigital.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Equalize Digital. We have two sponsors this evening who I would like to thank. The first is WP Engine. WP Engine is generously covering the cost of the live captions for tonight's meetup uh, and ensuring that it can be fully accessible to all of our attendees. Uh, WP Engine, if you're not familiar with them, they are a technology company. They have, uh, they started just with managed WordPress hosting. They also own the hosting company Flywheel, but they've grown beyond that and they have a variety of dev focused plugins and themes. Um, they're doing a lot in the um, block editor and full site editing land of WordPress. You can learn more about them at WPEngine.com. We also always encourage people to thank our sponsors, uh, send them a tweet and say thank you for sponsoring WordPress Accessibility Meetup because we want to encourage them to keep doing it. So if you want to tweet a thank you to them, they are at WP Engine on Twitter. And then after the meetup, we have a sponsor, Empire Caption Solutions, who has generously donated their services to help us create that corrected caption file and full transcript of the meetup. They, in addition to providing transcripts and captions for both live and recorded media, they also do audio description, sign language interpretation, and a lot of other um, services around ensuring that video and audio files are accessible for everyone. You can learn more about them at empirecaptions.com and they are at Empire Caption on Twitter. I don't think they use it too much, but it doesn't hurt to say thank you to them as well. We have a couple of upcoming meetups that you'll wanna book on your calendar, bookmark on your calendar. Um, on Thursday, October 6th at 10 a.m. Central Time, 
Uh, Daniel from Empower Captions will actually be speaking for us about the different types of transcripts that are available for both real time and recorded media and the different options and how to create those. So that will be a great one if you're interested in captioning and transcription. Then on Monday, October 17th at 7 p.m. Central, so in the same time slot, Colleen Gratzer from Gratzer Design will be talking about um, how to make accessible PDFs in InDesign. She'll be highlighting some of the common mistakes and how to fix them. So accessibility on the web extends beyond your website. It also includes any documents that you upload. So this will be a great talk if you or if you have clients that are creating PDFs that need to be accessible as well. And then save the date for November. We will not have our normal morning meetup because we're going to be doing WordPress Accessibility Day, which is a 24-hour conference. It's running November 2nd through 3rd. Uh, it's very exciting. We should have the schedule out soon because we just sent out all of our speaker notifications, uh, but you can learn more about that on wpaccessibility.day. I don't, it's not shown on the slide, but maybe Paola doesn't mind throwing that in the chat for you all if you want to go check it out. I think in about a week or two, we're going to open registration and it's totally free. Um, so definitely watch for that. I'm super excited to introduce today's speaker, Glenn Walker. Glenn has spoken for us before um, and did an intro to NVDA and it was very detailed and thorough and gave a ton of great information. So if you haven't seen that, go watch that. He walks through all of the settings in the NVDA screen reader. Um, he also is a frequent attendee of our meetup who provides tons of value and great information in the chat. Uh, so you may recognize him from there as well. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let Glenn take over sharing his screen. And then we can start diving into accessibility testing. Uh, while he's pulling that up, please note we have the chat. We also have a Q&A feature. It is a little bit helpful for us if you can put questions in the Q&A feature. I will try to watch the chat. Uh, in case you forget. So, but if you are able to put them in the Q&A feature, that is helpful. All right. So we have about an hour and 15 minutes. Is that right, Amber? Yes, sorry, I was okay. on mute. <laughs> All right, and one last plug before we jump in. One more cute kitty picture. I almost put a video up here when they're playing, but that would have been way too distracting. So there you go. If anybody has any recommendations on kitten names since they were just uh, adopted yesterday and I was waiting for their personalities to come out before I named them, always open to ideas. Maybe something will come up through, uh, through this presentation. All right, <clears throat> so yeah, about an hour and 15 minutes. And I wanted this to be uh, kind of less formal of a presentation and more of an interactive session because I'm going to talk about just some basic accessibility testing. And this is going to be for website testing, not documents, which was mentioned earlier. And um, so I'm going to go through some some basic testing. It actually, um, well, I was going to say it, it takes a bit of time really to become proficient at accessibility testing. But I didn't want to discourage people from trying to do it. And you know, if you've never done it before, where do I start? You know, what's the best thing to test? What tools should I use? What should I look for? And, and things like that. So I really wanted to start with keeping two things in mind for uh, for basic accessibility testing. The first, and I might actually get some feedback on this, is that accessibility testing is easy, actually, and um, Yes, there are a lot of requirements. If you look at the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, and if you're looking at, and all these terminology things, I, I won't go into full detail, but you know, if you're looking at version 2.1 level AA, which is kind of the standard uh, today, at least, 2.2 uh, is still being worked on. So if you look at WCAG 2.1 level AA, there are 50 requirements. And so, yeah, that, that can be a volume of checkpoints to do, but try to try to keep it simple. 
right? So a lot of accessibility really is fairly easy. And I just listed kind of three rough areas you can test with, um, tabbing, uh, the page structure, and colors. And then I kind of add, not to make it less important, but then I also add images at the end. Not that images are an afterthought. Everything is super important. If you have images on the page that convey information, if an image, for example, is part of a link and that link doesn't have any text, it only has an image, then that, then that image is pretty important and you want to make sure that it is accessible. But I was trying to keep this a little bit simple. You know, where do I start and uh, what should I focus on first? And maybe, you know, if your website is very uh, multimedia driven, if it has a lot of images, then images might be one of the first things you need to check and make sure they have alternative text and that they convey meaning, things like that. So it, it's somewhat dependent on the type of site you have. But for now, I'm going to talk about tabbing through the page, page structure, as well as colors. So keeping it simple and keeping it easy. And the second thing is your accessibility testing doesn't have to be exhaustive, right? I miss issues all the time when I'm testing a site. And it might be because of the data I have, I might not be able to get to a certain part of the page, or there might not be enough information on the page that populates and fills stuff on the page. I might not be able to, to get to it. So I might, might miss things that way. Or, you know, maybe it's a color contrast issue. You know, there could be a color contrast that is 4.4 .4 to 1, where the required minimum is 4.5 to 1. So it's just barely below and kind of using my rough eye catching tool <laughs> is, uh, you know, I look at a page and I kind of look at some colors jump out going, well, that doesn't look like it might have enough contrast and rather than using a tool to try to catch that. So I might miss a color contrast. Um, but any, any, any issues you find are going to help your page and it's a step in the right direction. So don't worry about trying to be so exhaustive that you feel like you need to catch every single thing on the page. Certainly that's a goal, but don't don't fret about that, right? Keep it easy, you know, keep it under control, tabbing page structure, colors, images, and there's a few other things. So I wanted to start off with that first, just to kind of ease people into it or ease your mind on, you know, accessibility testing. It feels like a, a very large topic. It doesn't have to be. And what I'm going to talk about today is how I personally test. Okay. And this is based on years of doing this, almost 20 years of accessibility testing. There really isn't a correct, quote, correct way to test, as long as you are testing against WCAG, which I'll, I'll bring up in a second. And you can test things in any order that you want. I'm going to show you what I do and kind of the, high, the order of things that I test. And, but again, that's just how I do it. Right? You don't have to do it that way. You might see something I do that's like, man, that doesn't make sense. I don't feel like testing that right now, or that should be part of something else. That's perfectly fine. There might be something I do, you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. And great. So you got something out of it. So you can test in whatever order you want to test with. You can use whatever tools you want to test with, anything that's comfortable for you. That was one of the things in a previous job when I was uh, running accessibility testing. I did not dictate what tools that a tester needed to use because some tools just work better for some people than others. It all kind of depends on your learning style and things like that. So there really aren't any prescribed, you know, here's the best tool to do this or the best tool to do that. It's whatever you feel comfortable with in using. And so, as I mentioned, when you do testing, you are essentially testing against WCAG 2.1 AA. And you can go to the official website on w3.org and you can see a list of all the guidelines on the left side in the uh, table of contents and there's numbers in front of all of them I won't go into what the numbers mean but this lists every every guideline single double and triple a so there are a lot of them and over in the right side on the page you can scroll down you can get to to one of them and start seeing, all right, success criteria 2.1.1 has to do with keyboard support, 2.1.2 is keyboard traps, and so on. And you have all this information. This really is what you're testing against. And might be why a lot of people think it's very overwhelming, because this is a 
this is a very big page. There's a lot of stuff on here, right? So how do I test for all that? That's a lot of stuff. Well, I like to use this little shortcut page that um, a friend of mine put together and uh, it's not official. It's not W3C um, sponsored or anything like that. It's just a way to see all the guidelines on one page. And uh, the website is three, the number three, pha.com slash WCAG2. And this is going to show, there's a little preferences uh, drop down here. It's showing single, double, and triple A. So I'm going to turn off triple A because I'm not going to test for that. And it shows you can look at 2.0, 2.1, or 2.2. I'm going to turn off 2.2 because that's not official yet. So that will leave me with 50 checkpoints when I'm testing. So here's really what I am testing anytime I look at a website. And again, right, there are 50 checkpoints here. That's a lot of stuff to check for. But going back to the my previous slide, I talked about tabbing through the page, um, looking at the page structure, and looking at colors, and maybe looking at images. Well, not maybe. You will look at images, but if you want to hold off on that. Um, depending on your site. So this is really everything that I'm looking at. And I mentioned that, uh, you know, if you want to test in order, um, you know, if you want to start with the very first one, 1.1.1, 1 .1 1 .1, which is images, that's fine. And go to the next one, all the 1.2s, these are multimedia. If you have videos or if you have podcasts on your website, then these will be important. And then go to the next one, 1.3.1, 1 .1, info and relationships, and so on all the way down that first column, and then go to the next column, 2.1.1. You certainly can test this way. Um, it might be a lot of, uh, I don't know, it might take longer if you do it this way, because there's a lot of testing you can do that overlaps. So when I talk about tabbing through the page, there's a lot of stuff that I'm testing as I'm tabbing through the page, other than just keyboard support. There's a catch is actually a lot of other things. And I'll point that out on I think maybe the next slide. So this is really how I test the, the things we're going to talk about today. And, and again, you can use whatever you want to use for testing and whatever order you want to do testing in, things like that. So as I mentioned, you could test numerically, start at 1.1.1 all the way through 4.1.3, which is the last one, um, which is new in, in 2.1. It has to do with dynamic content on the page. What I like to do is group things together. So this is kind of a very rough, and this this list of what, eight, it's like eight bullet points, um, might not cover all 50 checkpoints, but it will cover most of them when I do this. So with these first three bullet points, which is a quick test of the tab key, tab with custom focus style feet, and tab with the screen reader. If I only do that, I'm going to catch a pretty significant number of accessibility issues. So in this case here, you can cover almost, well, not almost, you can cover 14, maybe even more WCAG checkpoints. And that's, that's almost a third of your accessibility testing right there with those first three bullet points, tabbing through the page, looking where the focus indicator is and running with a screen reader in the background so you can listen to how things are announced. And it's fantastic. And then one of the, did I go through that slide already? I, I think I mentioned um, some previous testing or some previous slides you can look at or presentations. I have one that talks just about uh, using the tab key and testing and how much accessibility testing you can do with one simple key on the keyboard. Um, I think that's coming up in the next slide. And then I also talk about code inspection, and I have that highlighted here on the page. Um, don't let code inspection scare you. If you're not a coder, that's okay. It really doesn't take much to learn a handful of HTML tags, and that's really all you need to know. And th this will come, uh, part of it was is the next bullet point page structure. So when you're looking at a page and you're, you're you're trying to figure out, all right, this thing looks like a heading, or this thing looks like a list, or it looks like a table. You know, is it really coded as a heading or a list or a table? Well, that's where most often of the time I I bring up the code inspector in the browser and just see, all right, well, which HTML tag are they using? You know, if it's just bold font and a larger font that, for something that looks like a heading, well, then it's not really a heading, and that 
is going to hurt some users that rely on the actual structure of the page. So don't let code inspection scare you. Um, like it's just a handful of HTML elements. If you learn those, that will go a long way in helping you to test. And then again, I, I mentioned page structure and I'll go into a little bit of detail on each one of these bullet points, but I also wanna do a demo as well. So we can see, you know, kind of how, how easy it really is uh, to find some accessibility issues. And I have colors and images and some low hanging fruit, some real simple testing you can do uh, to catch a few issues. Hey, Glenn. Oh, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, we received a question. Uh, uh, Steve Horn is asking, is Max VoiceOver any value for the method you're talking about, or does it require a Windows screen reader in order to do this approach that you're talking about right now? No, this is a platform agnostic, I guess you'd call it. I mean, you can do this on a PC or a Mac or even mobile. Yeah, so it doesn't matter which platform you're on. Great. Thank you. Is that what the, okay, that was the question. Now, when we're talking about, which I'll have a screen in a second, um, when I'm talking about the custom focus uh, indicator, there's a way you can do it with Chrome and Firefox, which if you're using that on a Mac, then you can use this plugin. If you're using Safari, then you have to go into Safari settings and point your browser to a, an external CSS file. But I will uh, show that. that I had that slide hidden. It's coming up on slide eight, I believe. I had it hidden because I didn't know if we, I figured there'd be Mac users, but I didn't know if I'd get a Mac question. So I'm, I might actually show that slide. So yeah, this list here, this is really kind of generically, it, is, it doesn't matter if I'm on a PC or a Mac doing it, but I do have another bullet point at the bottom that says, do it all again in responsive view. So in other words, most pages, when you're looking at them on the desktop, if you were to look on that same page on your mobile device, Typically, a lot of the menus collapse down into what sometimes is called a hamburger menu, or it could be a kebab or a snowman menu, you know, three vertical dots or three horizontal lines. Same thing with the footer, it might collapse things and other parts of the page might collapse. You now have different interactive elements on the page that you want to test, make sure that it's going to work in a responsive view. Now, things like colors typically are not going to change in responsive view. See, it's not like a full retest when you're looking at a smaller screen size. Um, images, typically, you know, if an image has alternative text, that alternative text typically is not going to disappear just because you're in responsive view. Um, same thing with the page structure. If you have headings or if you have tables or lists, typically those are going to stay there even in responsive view. So it's not like a full retest, but you do want to um, either bump up your font on your desktop machine, which will hit the breakpoint um, at some point to show you what it would look like on mobile, or you can use a mobile emulator within the browser, and I'll, I'll show you both of those uh, real quick, or you can just get on your real mobile device and try it there. All right, so let's just talk about these first three bullet points, tabbing. So doing a quick test of the tab key, just to see if you can access, if you can get your focus on every element on the page that you can click with with the mouse or click on with the mouse, All right? So that's just making sure every interactive element, because oftentimes you're gonna find elements that might be just a div or a span tag and they have a mouse click handler. So only mouse users can actually interact with that element and a keyboard user can't tab to it or even if they could tab to it, they might not be able to select it. So this is really important to check because there are lots of different types of users that are keyboard only users. You know, it might be a mobility issue that they have to use a, a keyboard. My father had Parkinson's and so he had hand tremors and it was very hard for him to hold a mouse still to click on something, but it was much easier just to press the tab key and then press the enter key to select something. Um, uh, screen reader users, somebody with lower vision or no vision that's using a screen reader, they're going to navigate through the page using the tab key because typically you can't see where your mouse pointer is. So they're going to navigate that way. And some people just prefer the, the keyboard. You know, a power user can be much faster using a keyboard. So there's a lot of benefits for supporting a uh, keyboard as well as just tabbing. And there's other keys, you know, left, right key or up, down key when navigating through a list. Or a list box or a drop down, um, left and right, maybe to expand and collapse an element. 
So there are other types of keyboard elements, but tabbing is pretty, pretty frequent. But as far as these other two bullet points, using a custom style sheet and using a screen reader. So regarding a custom focus indicator using a style sheet, I go into pretty good detail of this at a previous meetup. Uh, it wasn't a WordPress meetup. This was the Nebraska Digital Accessibility Meetup. And this link was posted on today's meetup comment page. So if you need to get to that, I have it on the slide here, but um, you can get to that easier probably from today's meetup page and just go click on it. <clears throat> but all I really do is, <clears throat> excuse me, I run with a, a one line, one line of CSS and that's highlighted in yellow. And what this says, and again, I'm not a CSS guru. Um, yeah, I'm a very much a novice. So this one line of CSS that I use uh, says has star colon focus, which means every element on the page that can receive focus. So that would be links, it would be form elements. It could be something with tab index of zero. Um, anything that you can tab to will have a focus indicator. When I tab to that element, I want the outline to change to purple, which is hex FF00FF. So it's full intensity red and blue, um, no green. Green is set to zero. I'm going to have a solid outline. I want it to be four pixels wide. So I want it to be thicker than normal. And I want it to be important. So I want it to override everything else on the page. And just to show you real quick, well, we could see it here. There's kind of a purple outline around preferences. And if I tab, skip to operable, non-text content, 1.2.1. So there's actually a focus indicator on the page itself, which changes the text to white and the background to black when it receives focus. But I'm also getting this purple outline. And it may be easier to see on our, our test page today. And we're going to go into this at some point. But when I tab through here, I'm getting a purple outline around all the elements because I am running with my own custom style sheet because I want it to be very, very, very obvious to me where my focus is. I want to see what elements might get skipped over. You know, if there's a hidden, sometimes uh, you know, maybe there's a hidden element on the page and it's not really hidden, hidden, like display none with CSS. It's hidden by setting the position off to the left or up above the top of the screen. But when you push it off the screen, that doesn't hide it from the keyboard. I can still tab to it. It just means my purple outline is going to disappear because it's way off the screen and I can't see it. So that's a really important thing, <clears throat> excuse me, to check. And the way I set this, both in Chrome and Firefox, there's a plugin called Stylus, S-T-Y-L-U-S. And you can just do a Google search on that for both Chrome and Firefox. I'm actually a big Firefox user, you know, even though Chrome has been gaining ground. Well, I guess it's past Firefox now. It used to be Firefox was very popular, <clears throat> but I've been using it so long. And, and generally when you find a, an accessibility issue, it, for the most part, it doesn't matter if you found it on Chrome or Firefox or Safari or Internet Explorer, really it's going to be a problem on all these browsers. There are some minor differences. And I don't want to go into too, too much detail on that, you know, what the differences would be. Um, a real simple thing like a frame uh, element in Firefox is an automatic tab stop, whereas on Chrome, it is not. So when I tab through it, I will my focus will land on it on Firefox. And if that frame does not have any kind of label associated with it, then I won't know what it is. And so that would be an accessibility issue. Whereas on Chrome, tab is going to jump over it. So there's kind of not an accessibility issue there. Same thing with scrollable uh, containers. You know, if you have a container on your page, whether it's a div or whatever, that has scroll bars on it, whether vertical or horizontal, Firefox will make that container a tab stop so that I can tab to it. And then I can use my up and down and left and right arrow keys to actually scroll within that container. I mean, it's a great feature. Chrome does not let the focus go there by default. And so again, you have a case where, I, okay, well, I could tab to this on one browser. It probably should have a name so I know what it is, whereas the other browser doesn't let you tab to it. Um, so there's, there are some minor differences. But for the most part, if you see something that maybe should be a heading, but it is not coded as a heading, 
that's going to happen everywhere and you can find that with code inspection so and again if you go back to this other uh meetup page um, you can watch more information about more detail on stylus plugin and, and how to set the focus indicator and i think i mentioned on the on our comments it's a 40 minute presentation but if you set your playback speed to 1.5 times faster then it only takes about 25 minutes and let's see i think i've got yeah let me go to slide eight hidden slide can, secret can i ask you a question real quick Glenn? yep do you test with that focus indicator turned off first to figure out what things might be missing focus yeah indicators that, on the website that's a great question because if i go back to this slide where i talk about you know, using the tab key with these things, I can catch about 30%, about one third of all WCAG issues. Over on the right side, I list a few of them, 2.1.1 keyboard, 2.4.4 link purpose. These are things you can catch using the, the tab key and a custom style sheet and a screen reader. I did list 2.4.7 focus visible with an asterisk next to it. And down at the bottom, I say when testing for focus visible, you have to turn off the custom style sheet right? Because I want to see what the page really does for this particular guideline. So I, I, I do turn it off when testing for that particular guideline, but otherwise I have it on 90 plus percent of the time otherwise, if that makes sense. So in this case here, so I'm running with the plugin. I can actually turn it off. Now I can start tabbing through the page. I'm already down on the link. So I got a blue outline, which I think is probably Firefox's default. So in this case here, they're just letting links have whatever the default outline is. Let me tab backwards up to the menu. So in this case here, the menu goes from gray to white and has an underline. Well, that, that's my focus indicator. I can tell where my focus is. So I will tab through the page with my style sheet turned off to, tech, to test that specific guideline 2.4.7 but mm -hmm. otherwise yeah i have it on all the time just so i can see things thanks and then here's the if you're going to use safari on the mac you can go into um, preferences you can use command plus comma to get to preferences go to the advanced tab and then towards the bottom well, about halfway down the screen is something called style sheet and the default is none selected. It's a drop down uh, element. So if you select it, uh, there's a couple different choices there, but one of them is other. And when you select other, it brings up a file selector. And then you can go, so this one line of, of code, star colon focus outline, blah, blah, blah. If you put that into a separate text file, typically a CSS file, you have a dot CSS extension, but it doesn't matter. You could have a dot txt extension or whatever you want to call it but basically you would point safari to this to that external file and then you would get the same benefit on safari you would get the purple outline or whatever color or whatever outline style or thickness you want to use um, for your focus and we you know if we had more time maybe at the end i can play around with it sometimes i i change i don't use outline i'll use maybe font size so when i'm tabbing around something gets really big when i focus on it or background color, or you know, it could be anything. You know, if you're a CSS person, have fun. I just use outline on mine. So that was um, <clears throat> using the tab key, using a custom focus indicator, and tabbing with a screen reader. So regarding screen readers, which a screen reader is a separate piece of software that actually lots of different types of users use a screen reader it's pretty common with low vision or blind individuals but you could have someone who has cognitive issues maybe they have trouble focusing when they're reading you know whether it's a dyslexic issue or not and using a screen reader at the same time they're navigating through the page helps keep the person focused maybe it's a english isn't the first language on a page and and so maybe there's someone's trying to learn english better so they're listening to the screen reader and if you use one of the more naturally sounding voices instead of the robotic voice, then that can absolutely be helpful as you're learning another language. So there's all different kinds of screen reader users out there. And on the PC, uh, there's NVDA and JAWS. 
These are two popular screen readers. NVDA is free. There's a link on this slide and um, we can maybe send the slides out as well. But if you go to nvaccess.org, that's the company that makes NVDA and they have a download page. It's free, but they, you know, they do all this work for free. Um, they accept donations if you wanted to do that. Job access with speech, JAWS. They have a free trial mode. It works for 40 minutes. And then you, uh, you kind of have to reboot your computer. You don't have to. I've actually run with the 40 minute mode, let it expire. And then the next time I run it, um, I think it runs for about a minute or two before it says, hey, you're in trial mode. You used up your 40 minutes. You need to reboot if you want another 40 minutes. Usually within a minute or two, I can figure out the issue I need to check with JAWS. So sometimes I only need it for that long. If you want it to use for more length of time in the US, at least, and sorry for those who are not in the US, um, JAWS has a home license. license. It's $95 per year. So it's it's not a perpetual. They have like an unlimited license. Um, if you're going to use it for 10 years or more, it might be worth it. I think it's like a thousand bucks. Um, but if you do use the home license, uh, like for me, I could not use the home license because it's not for commercial use. And so when I do accessibility testing for a client, you know, if I wanted to, well, not if, when I honor the, the EULA agreement, I'm not going to use it for commercial purposes. So I'm not going to buy JAWS home license and use it for commercial purposes. But if you need it for yourself, um, maybe you're just learning about accessibility, you want to play around with it, you want to test websites for fun and not get paid for it just because you want to improve your skills, then absolutely go ahead and do that. And then on the Mac, uh, you have VoiceOver, which is free. It's built in. You already have it. You don't have to do anything other than hit Command F5 to turn it on. And uh, it comes on Mac OS and, and it's on iOS as well. And I don't really talk about mobile much today, but you know, if you have an Android device, you have TalkBack built in as well. I found that uh, VoiceOver, it's a little bit different to interact with VoiceOver when it's running, or it's a little bit different to interact with a web page when VoiceOver is running than it is on a PC when JAWS or NVDA is running. NVDA and JAWS don't really do anything funky to your keyboard other than there's a forms mode and browse mode, which I don't know that I'll get into today, but um, it's it's a little bit easier, I think, uh, starting off with a screen reader, screen reader on the PC than it is on the Mac, but voiceover, there's lots of tutorials. I mean, you can look on, YouTube for a voiceover tutorial or go to apple.com. They have tutorials there as well. So it's just a little bit learner, uh, steeper learning curve um, if you're gonna go that route. Glenn, someone had a question about, um, C was wondering if you can use the narrator under accessibility options in Windows 11. Does that work sufficiently or do you recommend installing a third-party screen reader? Yeah, it, it, it's gotten a lot better. So I think you can do um, it's either shift windows N or control windows N. There's the windows logo uh, will turn narrator on or you can go into settings and turn it on yourself. There is a shortcut key for it. I've used it a bit um, when I didn't have, if a computer was locked down, if I was using maybe a client's laptop, you know, maybe I'm doing work for a client and they want me to do it on their laptops and they're very IT locked down and I can't install uh, a screen reader. Typically, narrator is there because it's part of Windows, and I can use that. And it's it's decent. Um, it's gotten a lot better. It has some very similar shortcut keys as NVDA and JAWS. Like I can use H to navigate to a heading, T for a table, L for a list. Um, I think it might have some different voices you can install. Well, I don't know if you can install or not. Um, it might come with some different voices, but yes, you can use narrator. Uh, it's not a very popular screen reader, but if you had to use it, you could. And whoops. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever heard a blind person tell me that they use narrator. Yeah. So that makes me hesitate to want to test with that because I would rather yeah. test with screen readers that more people are using. It's, I don't know if you feel the same way. I wouldn't, if you have availability to NVDA or JAWS, absolutely use those. 
if for whatever reason, like I said, if it's locked down and you only have narrator, then okay, use it. But it, yeah, I don't recommend it as a first choice. And this is a survey, this is on the WebAIM website, a survey of, of screen reader users commonly used. You can see JAWS still has a slightly bit of a lead over NVDA. And this is, I think the results here, if somebody uses both, they're gonna mark them both. So it's, this isn't an exclusive list, like one only uses, person uses just one of them and not the other ones. Um, JAWS used to be way, way, way higher and NVDA had been slowly catching up. I thought NVDA had passed them, but apparently not. Um, and then you can see voiceover because if you're on a Mac, sometimes that's your only choice. Or if you're on iOS, that's your only choice. It's actually pretty high, 40% uh, people using it. It used to be you know, down in the teens. Um, so it's come quite a bit, but narrator, that's pretty respectable in fourth place there at uh, 36%. So it's not, totally unheard of, um, but, and then you got these outliers, Chrome Vox, I, I would not recommend using it all. Um, it, it doesn't seem to work that great. So yeah, as far as the types of screen readers you wanna use, but NVD and JAWS, that's why I have those listed here. That's why I don't have narrator. And then um, I mentioned, you know, about two weeks ago, I think about four, uh, 18 days ago, was uh, beginning of September, uh, Nick Corbett was here at the WordPress meetup and talked about training screen reader users, uh, screen reader user testers, so people that test using a screen reader. And you could tell that Nick is very much a keyboard shortcut guy if you watched that, or if you go back and watch it. I mean, it was fantastic. I love it because I, I love keyboard shortcuts and he was doing keyboard shortcuts for everything, you know, inside of, um, Excel and, and other documents uh, that he was looking at. So if you wanna go back and look about and, and watch that recording, I have the link here. And I don't think, I didn't put that on the um, on the meetup page. Um, Bill is probably gonna post it here in the, in the chat. And um, I also have details as mentioned, as Amber mentioned earlier on, uh, I talked about NVDA, how to set it up, you know, changing some of the settings typically you kind of want to use a screen reader out of the box and don't change any, any settings because you don't want things to be different than how a user might have it. Although most screen reader users um, are going to change their settings anyway. So sometimes using it right out of the box isn't that great, but I go through details of the setup and I change some of the settings that don't affect uh, the accessibility testing. They just make it a little bit easier to use, setting up some shortcuts with the screen reader and, and a few other things to make things a little easier to test. So if you want to go back, um, not quite a year ago, November of last year, and there's a link on Equalize Digital. And again, that was posted in today's meetup comment page if you want more details on how to set that up. So let's go ahead and then do a, a short de demo. I think I saw Christina's name earlier in the uh, cat uh, <laughs> cat naming section. She volunteered her website uh, to do some testing. It's called uh, crownpointgardenclub.org. And so I'm going to pop over there real quick. And I'm only going to, well, I have a hard time when I go look at a website, I have all these, I get flooded with information. I'm like, oh, there's a list. There's a heading. Oh, there's some color issues. Oh, there's a, there's an image. You know, I, I, you, know you get really flooded um, once you've been doing this for some time. So I was trying, it was really hard for me you know, I've only talked about tabbing and custom style sheet and running with a screen reader initially. So that's what I'm trying to keep my blinders on and focus on that. I might see a squirrel run by and get sidetracked on a, another issue. But for now, I will try to keep it just to talk about tabbing on the web page. And so we've got Crown Point Garden Club. And I didn't mention earlier, but so I have a very wide monitor and I'm sharing my whole screen because I'm going to pop over between the browser and the code inspector and maybe even some uh, a text editor to show you some code and i like to put those side by side and so I, I want you to be able to see it and i try to bump up the font and i can i can bump it up a little more you know if it makes it a little bit easier to see but you can uh, amber let me know in the chat if somebody needs it a little bit bigger but the first thing i'm doing so as soon as this page comes up 
I'm just going to tab into the page. I have my custom style sheet, so I see a purple outline around things. The first thing I see is skip to the content, which almost sounds like I want to be an active person and skip around and skip to the content. This is actually, this is a great one. 2.4.1, I believe the number is, is called bypass blocks. And bypass blocks. So all we're doing now is, again, I'm just using the tab key with the uh, my focus indicator. I didn't start up the screen yet. I'll do that in a second. Um, so skip to content is one of the things you can test with, with the tab key. This basically says, if you have a common list of things that is on every page, which almost describes every single page you go to because you almost always have the same menu on this on uh, at the top of the page where you might have a login page or whatever you know a whole bunch of stuff on the main menu it's repeated on all the different pages you go to well for a keyboard user having to skip over all of that stuff just to get the main content kind of the meat of the page is could be difficult if i'm using a sip and puff device where i have to navigate all these elements, you know, if I have to puff every time to do a tab, well, that's, a, you know, I might get kind of lightheaded having to puff all those times to, if you had a very big menu to tab through. So having a skip to content is awesome as the first element on the page. And as you probably, well, maybe you didn't notice, if I tab off of it, it's gone. So as a mouse user, and this should delight the designers out there, you don't necessarily have to have a skip to content always visible on the page. It can be helpful to always have it, but it doesn't have to be there. So in this case here, if I were a mouse user, I would never see that because I don't really need it to skip over the content. I just go point my mouse to whatever I want to get to. But as a keyboard user, as soon as I tab into the page, it suddenly appears. So that's a, it's a great feature to have. So if I tab in, so Crown Point Garden Club, the main heading, I'm guessing of the page, maybe it's not a heading, I didn't check, but it receives focus, which must, well, doesn't must mean, but it probably means it's an interactive element. Um, you typically do not want your focus to go to things that are not interactive, things that you would not normally click on. In this case here, because I'm looking down at the bottom left corner of my browser, I can see a, a URL listed. So yes, indeed, this is a link and it just kind of goes back to itself, but that's okay. But let me, um, let me pop back up. Let me turn on the screen reader and I'm going to use NVDA. And you should have heard a piano note. That's when NVDA starts. And meet Cr Crown yep. Point Garden Club, growing okay. in East Hamilton. So I have, um, I've slowed the speech down a little bit, so hopefully it'll be easy to understand. I don't run with it like super fast, like a native screen reader user would. I mean, that would be Rate 35. Crown Point Garden Club visited link. List with five items. That's probably kind of slow for a native screen reader user, believe it or not. Um, rate rate, rate 20. 20. Rate, rate 10. Crown Point, skip to the content right, link. Skip to the content link. Great. It's a link. Glenn? I know it's going to navigate me. Yeah, go ahead. Do you mind increasing the speech viewer um, oh, size? Yeah. We talked about that, didn't we? Totally forgot. Okay. Thank you. So skip to content link. I heard that it was a link. That's fantastic. Now I know it's going to navigate me. If I tab again. Crown Point Garden Club visited link. Another link. Crown Point Garden Club. List with five items. Right. Home Several visited pieces link of information page. here are announced by the screen reader that you might take for granted uh, as a cited user. The first thing was list with five items. And it doesn't say that anywhere on the screen, but there's a menu. And that menu, if I look at it, home, post, contact us, next meeting, garden tours. Okay, yeah, there are five items in the menu. That's fantastic. Now, as a screen reader user, I know there's five items in the menu and you know that I'm gonna have to tab probably five times to get past it and whatever is beyond it. Now that's because this menu was coded using re a real list in HTML. And um, I'll talk about lists in a little bit when we talk about page structure. Again, I'm trying not to get distracted by the squirrel. I'm only doing tabbing right now and not page structure, but 
it's really fantastic when it's coded as a list, right? As a cited user, you look at this list and you can probably with a you know a split second go, okay, yeah, there's five items there. I can kind of see five items across. And the screen reader user got that information as well. And then it read home, because that's the text. And it said current page, which I'll talk about in a minute. But let me just tab across this menu. Post slash news visited right. link. Post slash news. You know, whether the slash is announced or not doesn't really matter. Does it add anything? I don't, maybe, maybe not. Um, there are actually slashes between each menu item. It might be hard to see. I don't put my focus on it, but if I navigate with the screen reader to every element on the page, then I might hear those, but let me stay focused again real quick. Now listen to the next one. Contact US visited link. Contact US visited link, right? So visually it looks like contact us and that's what it is but the problem here is some screen readers when they see all uppercase letters they will try well it's kind of hit or miss it depends on the words it might announce all the letters separately because it thinks it's talking about the united states it saw uppercase us that's usually how the us is used so it said contact us instead of contact us is that a wcag issue no it's not it's more of a usability, a user experience type thing. You know, is this something you want to fix? Maybe, you know, this is kind of a low priority UX, depends on what you want to focus on. And if we inspect this. Menu, developer tools, developer tools, crown point, garden, NVDA. So over on the right side is the code inspector. And I'm looking at the link for contact us. And again, if you're not a, code person or, or not a CSS person. There's only just a handful of things you need to look at and, and understand. But for now, I'm just interested in this link, this anchor tag. If I go over and look at the CSS, there is a uh, text transform uppercase. I don't know if you can Developer. Developer. I just turned it, well, I clicked on it, but if I turn it off, so I turned off the style in the in the code inspector. And if I go back and look over on the page, well, now everything is mixed case, which for me personally, I find that easier to read, having mixed case instead of uppercase. But that's a design decision, whether you want it all uppercase or not. But now, Crown Point Gar now when posts, I tab to it, contact us, contact visited us, link. Right, instead of contact US. So that's just, a little thing you might want to check, you know, as as I was tabbing through the page, this is why I'm running with a screen reader so that I can hear how things are announced. This might be something I want to change, might not be. If I do want to change it, maybe I still want it all uppercase. Let me turn back on. Developer tool. And speech I'm going to turn off, off the speech for the screen reader for the second for the, while I'm changing this because I don't need it telling me all the code. If, if I really want it uppercase, but I still want it to say contact us instead of contact us i could and this might get a little too nerdy but i could change it and i can change it on this page just to see how it sounds but this isn't obviously going to change the real website you'd have to go whoever owns it would have to change it i could add an aria label and say contact us and use lowercase or i could have you know contact the c and contact uppercase and the u and us uppercase or mixed case whatever I could have it like that. Actually, let me, just to prove I'm not making this up, let me mislabel that just so it's not gonna use it. Turn on. Speech, crown point. All right, so I turned uppercase Post. back on, so it should say US again. All right, Contact so US visited link. Now let me Post give slash it an ARIA label. Developer tools crown point X. All right, now let me tab back to still point. uppercase but I gave it an ARIA label of contact us in lowercase. All right, contact now maybe us you get the best link. of both worlds. It says contact us, and it also shows it all uppercase if that's your design decision to do so. So that's just a little, you know, a little thing to catch um, with pronunciation. And again, there is not anything in WCAG that says things have to be pronounced properly. That's something that's always good uh, to try to do. Um, but you do have to be careful 
when you start using aria tags if you use them care if you use them properly it's fantastic if you use them improperly it could be worse than if you had not used them at all and let me just show you an example and well let me pause for a second are there any questions on that amber I don't think I saw a question specific to that. NVDA. Okay. Let me just show you. So I used an ARIA label. And an ARIA label is going to override whatever text is in the link. And in our case, because I used the same text, contact us, but just all over case, it didn't matter. But it can go bad. If I go to this next meeting, Crown Point, and I go to RSVP required, next meeting. which is going to go outside of the site. It's going to go to Eventbrite, just to show you an example. I'm kind of going off, Crown Point off Gar script Crown a little bit. Point Garden. Let me bump this up a little bit. Font. So they have a menu in the upper right. It says Browse Events, Organize, Help, Log In, and Sign Up. Organize has a menu drop-down link. Menu drop-down. Drop Crown Point Garden Club. One combo. Save to. Crown point. Okay, so they have a skip link. link. That's great. It popped up. But I want to navigate over to the menu on the right side. Event bright clickable triggers. Quick, link, quick link. link link. Well, the link at the end is just because it's a link. So quick link is what it's announcing. Browse events is what I see. I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. Let me go to the next one. Menu, menu drop, down, drop down link one of one. Okay. Well, I'm seeing organize. What is this menu drop down? Let me go to the next one. Menu drop, menu drop down, drop down. Link one of one. Another quick link. Quick Another link quick link. link. Yeah, you know, this is link, link. this is bad. You know, it looks great, but with a screen reader, and if I were not running with a screen reader, if I were just tabbing through the page, I'd go, well, you know, I can tab to these things. Maybe I can get to quick, the menus. Menu, oh, list you know, everything's three. great. Everything's great on this page menu. until you listen to it. That's why I always run with a screen reader at the same time. And if we look. Quick link link. Developer tools crown. Way. NVDA's. Developer tools crown point garden uh, club August meeting tickets. Wednesday, uh, August 24th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Event bright HTTPS. Event bright really confuses or sometimes confuses NVDA. I got a spinny cursor now and NVDA kind of locked up. Is it still there? There it is. No, nope, it just died. Sort of. So I was looking at browse events and I had that link up. Let me uh, let me just make sure there's NVDA is not running in the background. Control shift escape. I, I love keyboard shortcuts as mentioned. Control shift escape if you want a little handy keyboard brings up the task manager directly. And actually if I look for NVDA. Okay, I don't see it, so it must have properly died. But this website, or maybe it's Firefox, that's uh, having a problem. But at least I still have the code up. The uh, browse events link anchor tag has an ARIA label of quick link. So it's doing kind of what we were trying to do with the contact us. The problem is that whatever developer was writing that works for Eventbrite and was coding this, maybe they thought that ARIA label was an additive thing. In other words, it's going to read my ARIA label and it's going to read my text that's inside the link. And that's just not, that's not what it does. So it kind of shows that, first of all, the developer maybe had a misperception of what ARIA label does. Secondly, the developer didn't test it, right? They just stuck it in there. They didn't try running with a screen reader. Otherwise, this would have been a very obvious issue. And that's, that kind of bothers me more that there are developers out there who are throwing some ARIA attributes around. Maybe ARIA will be the name of my cat, one of my cats, but they're throwing ARIA attributes around and not even trying it, right? This it really bugs me that something so simple as this, so easy to test is, is missed. Um, but apparently, uh, yeah, it really hosed up my browser. I'm gonna kill Firefox. And bring it up, restore my session, hopefully. Yay. Because I have like 250 links open. It's terrible, I know, but. 
I'm pretty sure the number of open tabs that you have at any given moment helps us understand how awesome of a developer <laughs> or a accessibility tester someone is, right? The more the more open uh, tabs, the better. <laughs> I don't know if that's <laughs> true or not, but yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, if I were to go through, here's all my all the links tabs I have open. And I do all kinds of testing on all kinds of different stuff. And anyway, so we're back on the browse events page. And as I mentioned, this link had ARIA label equals quick link. Same thing with organize, which is probably under this next div. Div, div, div. Oh, I should have just done an inspect on it, but all right. So here's an anchor tag. Role equals menu tab in zero. Aria label equals menu drop down link. They actually have the word link in it, which is you're going to hear link link because it's already a link. Well, no, they have role equals menu. So they're actually changing it from a link to a menu item, but they still want to hear link for some reason, even though it's a menu item, but they're not actually going to hear the word organize because they're misusing Aria label. So you have to be careful when you use ARIA. And if we go back to WebAIM, so WebAIM is a, is a fantastic research company. Um, they're actually based right down the street from me. Um, I'm in Northern Utah. They're, they're based in at Utah State University and they, they have some fantastic uh, resources on their website, webaim.org. And they have uh, the WebAIM Million where they analyzed the homepage of the top 1 million websites. And the million websites are based on, um, I forgot where are they, Majestic Million, Alexa Top Million, Dom Cop Top 10 Million. So they, they used, they didn't just pick randomly a million, well, that would take forever, right? <laughs> to pick a million pages to test. But they tested the homepage of the top 1 million websites just to see how accessible they are. But with a caveat that uh, they're running a scanning tool and scanning tools, depending on who you ask, uh, catch 20, 30% of accessibility issues. The other 70 to 80% of accessibility issues have to be found manually by hand by a human being instead of scanning. Now, if you're a scanning tool uh, vendor, if you have your own scanning tool, then your number is gonna be probably a lot higher because you're a marketing guy and say, you know, we, we can actually catch 50% or 60%, but I generally have not found any scanning tool that can do that because there's a lot of subjectivity. You know, something that should be a heading, a scanning tool can't really look at, well, maybe it could to see if the font size of something is bigger than the surrounding text. And then it might go, well, it's a bigger font. We think maybe it's a heading and a scanning tool might be able to do something like that. But anyway, the reason I brought this up is because they have a section about pages that have ARIA attributes on it. And ARIA attributes are just part of HTML. It's just additional information you can add to an HTML tag to kind of give a hint to screen readers, uh, to screen reading software. But they found, um, so they tested 1 million home pages. They found 60 million ARIA attributes were used, which you know, 60 million divided by 1 million is 60 ARIA attributes on average on the home page. You know, that's a lot. That's, you know, ARIA label equals this, ARIA expanded. It could be role equals menu, role equals button. Um, I don't think they include tab index. Oh, it says down here. Yeah, they do it. They do actually include tab index as an ARIA, even though that's it's been around a lot longer than ARIA. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the key thing here is that it says that home pages with ARIA generally have 70% more errors than pages without ARIA because they're being because it's being used incorrectly. Right? Typically ARIA is great and fantastic. It, it helps a lot of things if you use it the right way. But if you're not sure how it should be used, and I'm getting on my soapbox again. Generally, most ARIA attributes are pretty simple to, and easy to understand. Um, this ARIA label overrides all the text. Well, it's documented that it does that. So why would you do that and not test it and then 
make it public, you know, on, on Eventbrite. I don't, I don't have any sympathy <laughs> for those developers, but um, so, but I did, I did wanted to point out that uh, you know, using Aria can be good. Um, well, can be good if you use it the right way. It will be good if you use it the right way. It can be bad if you use it the wrong way. But while I'm on this page, I just kind of want to do a real quick side thing. If I scroll down a little bit, um, they have a list of categories, which is really cool. So on average, there are about 50 errors, 50 accessibility issues on the home on every home page, on average. So they have this table here of pages that do better than average. So they have less than 50. And then pages that do worse that have more than 50. And it's interesting that the top category of website is law, government, and politics, because generally there are laws governing law or .gov websites to say they have to be accessible. So because there are requirements to make them accessible, you know, they have still not great. There are still 30 issues, 30 errors on the homepage compared to 50. It's better than 50, but it's still not that great, right? Social media has come a long way, you know, whether you're on um, LinkedIn or, or Pinterest or, or whatever, you know, those have come a long way and have improved their accessibility. You know, science and technology, that's great. And those are, are good as well. Education, we would hope that education would be very, very high. And a lot of times, you know, .edu websites, if they receive government funding, then they have to adhere to some government accessibility regulations. So it's kind of forced onto them. Um, I guess religion, not doing so good there. It's right about average at 52. Home and garden, I don't know, travel, pets. Oh man, pet websites are worse than average. So it's just kind of an interesting thing to look at. Shopping, right? Shopping is something so common to do, but it, it has tons and tons of issues. Whereas food and drink, which is really shopping as well, but it specifically, I don't know why food and drink is separate from shopping, but it does a lot better than generic shopping. And some of you may have noticed there's actually adult content, which is horribly inaccessible, which maybe is a good thing. Um, one of the companies I worked for, we had a client that had, I don't know who it was, they had adult content and they wanted us to test their website. And uh, I said, no, thank you. Um, the, the salespeople, the financial guys, people, uh, they all, they wanted the income from the customer. And I said, you know, I'm not gonna ask any of my accessibility testers to test this. Um, sorry, that's, I kind of draw the line there. Maybe that, you know, yell at me if you want to, but we're not gonna check that alt that images have alt text or that headings are correct or anything like that. That's just, I'm not, you know, so I'm kind of, it's nice to see there's a, almost a hundred issues on per page. Um, it's 80% worse than the average. Um, anyway, side, side topic, that was my squirrel. I was trying to focus on tabbing and stuff. And if you look at the domain name, .gov, again, because of requirements, .edu, that's great. Now, .edu, you can see there's there's 13,000, almost 14,000 homepages. If we went back up to education, there were 58,000 pages. So I'm not sure. Category-wise, I guess there are some non-.edu. You know, if they're not university pages, they fall under education. I'm not sure how all those things work, but government, edu, Canada. Yeah, way to go. Canada's way up there. Um, maybe because of AODA or who knows what in the UK is up there. And then down at the bottom, China and Russia, sorry. They're, you know, they're not focusing on accessibility, I guess. It, Italy is not too much far behind, further behind and then Poland and India, um, some bad stuff. But .com is like right there in the middle, 50%. Hey, Glenn, sorry to yep. interrupt. I just wanted to make sure you knew that we were at 815 in case you wanted to do okay. more like working down this page. Yep. All right, I think um, we heard, let me bring this back up. So we're on the next meeting. Next meeting, Crown Point. Remember this time. 
list with five items garden tours. So Main if we look at the menu, home, post, contact us, next meeting, garden tours, we're on the next meeting page right now because it's white, the menu is white and it's underlined. So as a visual user, I can tell which page I'm on because I can see that one's highlighted compared to all the other ones. Well, what about a screen reader user? Are they gonna know that that's the currently selected menu item? Well, let's double check. List with five items, garden tours at Pipeline Pollinator Paradise visited right, link. The link, that's a really long link, so it's hard to hear all that. So if I tab to next meeting. Next meeting visited link, current page. Current page. So there's a little bit of extra information at the end. If I go to contact us. Contact US visited link. Posts slash news visited link. All the link. other links just say the link name, and then they say whether it's visited or not, and then link. But next meeting. Next meeting visited link current also page. Also has current page. That's fantastic. So that means somebody is using ARIA current. Menu. Next NVD. So we look at the code. There's an anchor tag, ARIA current equals page. And ARIA current can have several different values. It can be true, false. It can be a step in a process. It could be a lot of different things. But the main point was that somebody is using ARIA and ARIA attribute correctly. So it makes it sound better. So this is something I would look for, you know, as a sighted user, as a sighted tester, I see that one of the menu items looks different than the others, but let me listen to it and see if it actually sounds different, if there's something else about it. Let's go back to the homepage because there's one other. Next meeting, Crown Point Garden, one NVD. I wanted to show you. Meeting control, Crown Point, Crown Point, Crown, Main Landmark Pipe, so let me just tab through all these links. Crown Point Garden. Sign up for complimentary right, landmark. I'm on the search. I'm trying to get to the map below the Crown Point Garden Club. So let me tab a couple more times. Search button. Figure data equals 4M13, 1M73, M610X882C994. Link. <laughs> That's my link. All right. Figure says data equals 4M13, blah, 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 blah. That's my link name, right? And this is, I mentioned this earlier, earlier, we have an image that is inside of a link. The link itself doesn't have any text to display and the image doesn't have any alternative text. So this would be, even though I listed images kind of later in, that, in my list of things to look for, um, this is actually a really, really important uh, issue to fix because the user won't know what this is. Um, you know, it's trying to read the URL and different screen readers and different browsers will do different things. It might say blank if it can't find anything or it might try to read the URL because it's trying to be helpful and let you know. But in this case, the URL is actually just a bunch of numbers and letters and, and uh, special characters. So it doesn't really help me in that case. All right, so let's... Um, I have a few more slides here. So there's, and we'll probably jump back to that page. So we talked about tabbing, focus indicator with a screen reader. We did code inspection because code inspection I do all throughout my testing process. It's not like I do all the tabbing once and then I go, oh, let me go do code inspection now and read all the code. I don't do that. I actually use code inspection as a supplemental augment my testing of, of all the other different things I do. Now, page structure, um, this is really important. So the page structure 1.3.1 is one of the WCAG requirements. This is probably one of the most, uh, there's probably a handful, three or four top failures. And this is one of them. And this basically says, and, and I have a picture of a duck or a duckling maybe um, on the page. Because I like to think of this as 1.3.1 info and relationships as the duck test, which is if you haven't heard of that, you know, if it looks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it probably is a duck. Well, if something looks like a heading, then it should be a heading. If something looks like a list, then it should be a list. That's really all this is saying. And so when I look at the page back over here. Right, here's some big text. The word home is much bigger than the stuff in front of it. So this is where I would, I typically do um, 
well, kind of a combination a code inspection or use a bookmarklet. But right now, let me just do inspect on the home. It's an H1 tag. All right, here's one of the handful of things, handful of HTML elements that you should probably learn. H1 is a heading, heading level one. Great. That looks good. Scroll down. All right, here's meetings, our mission, our activities. Well, let me just take a peek at it. Oops. Meetings is really just a paragraph text and it has strong, strong around it to make it bold. All right, so the user, the screen reader user will not be able to navigate this page by headings using the H key. And that's one way you can figure out and test for headings is just to use the H key. Or there's um, what I call bookmarklets. Well, not what I call, they are called <laughs> bookmarklets. And if I show you, I think I actually have a, a page on them, how to test, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. Bookmarklets are really just a little piece of JavaScript code that runs on the page. And so in this case here, I have one called headings. And if I double click on it, it will go through the page and highlight all my headings on the page. So put a box around home and put an H1 in the meetings and around because they are not headings. So this is one way for me to see well, it looks like a duck, it looks like a heading, but it's not a heading. Well, that's that's a failure. Pretty easy to test and pretty easy to see. Pop back over here. Um, the other screenshot, so I had home and meetings on the left screenshot. On the right screenshot is a list, or it looks like a list. It has numbered things on it. First thing you do is install. The second thing you do is migrate. The third thing you do is rank. Well. And as a sighted user, I can see very easily there's a block of stuff on the left. That's my first step. The block of stuff in the middle is my second step. As a screen reader user, um, this really should be coded up as a list because it looks like a list. It looks like a duck. It should be a duck. Um, but it's not in this particular case. Super easy to fix. But this is a case where you're looking at the page. You're going, well, well here's some numbered items. Usually numbers are a list. Let me see if it's coded as a list. Code inspect or use a screen reader and see if it says list when it, when it comes across it, um, and it doesn't. So I mentioned a test for page structure. You can use code inspection. We just inspected the H element bookmarklet. We use that to highlight the heading or use a screen reader. I can navigate using the H key and it'll jump to all the headings. If there's no heading, then it won't find it. And that's just another way to test it. Um, I probably use in this case, maybe bookmarklets to highlight all the headings to see what's what's marked as a heading. Um, but as far as bookmarklets, if you do a Google search on accessibility bookmarklets, you'll find a whole bunch of them. And again, they're just JavaScript pages. Uh, you know, we're going to run out of time. I'd, I'd love to talk about them more, but won't have time for that. We're almost at the end of the slides, which is a good thing. Five minutes left. And then I mentioned colors. Um, you know, scanning tool, you can use a scanning tool to catch colors, but they can often be tricked or faked out by CSS. And so depending on how you code your CSS, a color contrast issue might not be flagged by a scanning tool, in which case you're missing an issue, or the opposite, it might flag an issue as a color contrast issue. When you're looking at it visually, there's no problem. And it's just the way the CSS was was coded. So scanning tools are OK, um, but they can be fooled. Uh, Wave by WebAIM. We talked about WebAIM earlier. Axe is another. These are both plugins for your browser. Um, I typically do just manual checking. you know. But how do I know what colors to check? That kind of comes over time. So if I go back to the uh, crown point, um, for me, when, I, when this page first came up, a uh, red flag went off with a light gray text on a black background. I'm like, well, I don't know if that's got enough contrast. And then same thing with the, I don't know what you would call that color. It's kind of a light brown or a dark yellow. The link text on a yellow background, to me, again, would flag in my head that that might not be good. Um, and I kind of scroll through it. I thought there was a couple other ones. but. With the color contrast, one of the issues here, there's a color contrast analyzer tool. And I mentioned this on the um, 
Well, let me bring it up first, and then I'll pop over to the slide. If you do a search on color, oh, well, technically I misspelled it. Color Contrast Analyzer has the British or maybe Canadian spelling has a U in color. Although if you search for color, C-O-L-O-R, Contrast Analyzer, you'll still find it. Um, it's a tool from, uh, it's from DQ, I think, right? Um, I don't, let me, it's TPGI, sorry. It's one of those two. They actually have, so I have two screenshots here. The one on the right is what it currently looks like. And it's kind of their newer, well, newer, it's probably five, maybe older than that, years old. I didn't like it. I didn't get anything out of their new version. I still use the older version, which is my other screenshot on the left, um, which looks like, you know, kind of an old school Windows dialogue type thing. Problem was when the new one came out, they initially had broken uh, the keyboard shortcut for capturing foreground and background colors. And I'm a keyboard person. And I was thinking, you know, an accessibility tool that broke keyboard support is not a good thing. So I didn't like the new version. So I always stick with the old version. And I know we're getting low on time, but if we just want to look real quick, if I bump up the font, one of the problems with color contrast droppers is that when you have a font, sometimes it can be hard to pick the right color in the font. And that's because, let me bump this up really big. So let's look at the word East in East Hamilton. If I use my color dropper and I wanna go pick that gray, there's some anti-aliasing going on. So I don't know if you can see on the left edge of the E, it's kind of a bluish color, right? Because it's, it's going between the dark gray background to light gray text and it kind of picks a color in between, which I guess is blue. Even on the horizontal lines on the E, there's like a dark gray on the top of one. There's like a lighter gray. So there's an anti-aliasing. And you don't want to pick that color, right? If I were to pick that, it's kind of a bluish color. And I can't make, there's no way to bump the font up in this dialogue, sorry. But that makes the color, oh, I didn't choose the background. Background says white. Background is actually this darker gray. 2.9 to 1 actually fails contrast color but I didn't actually choose the right color. I have to do, if you look for um, letters that are vertical or horizontal and pick somewhere in the middle, you can usually get the right color. All right, now it's 8E, 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 which is a form of gray. Now it's 5.1, well, that passes, great. So just be careful when you're using a color dropper that you don't pick an anti-aliasing. Usually I go to the CSS. So I'll do an inspect, look at the CSS, see what color it really is, and use that color in my analyzer tool. Um, and then this yellow, if we wanted to check it real quick, get a vertical line like the letter T, background color is yellow, 2.4 to 1. Again, that fails uh, contrast. Images, we kind of talked about images already. Code inspection, bookmarklets, scanning tools. It's not the last one to do, but you know it, it is there. Low hanging fruit, this is simple stuff you can test. Make sure the page has a title, right? Look at the browser tab, All right? For this one here, if I hover over the tab, it says Ground Point Garden Club growing in East Hamilton. Well, it has a page title, great. Check, that one's done. Make sure a language is specified for the page. And that's in the main, the very first HTML page. So if I bring up Code Inspector, go to the very top, very first line, HTML lang for language equals en-ca. I guess that's Canadian English instead of just English. I don't know if that means it allows it to have a and take off or what. Some <laughs> different versions of Canadian. Sorry, there's probably people from, I saw somebody from Hamilton earlier and they said, this is in Hamilton. That's what, just outside southwest of Toronto, I think. I know there's an accessibility Hamilton group, Alley Y, Alley Ham, I think. Anyway, but that was kind of the last thing. Oh, I keyboard shortcuts. I don't, I didn't really go into this much um, or at all. As I mentioned, I have my code inspector. There's some cool sheet keyboard shortcuts that let me dock windows left and right, um, which I put on the slides, which you can get a copy of just so you can play around with these. Um, mouse pointer location. There's a really cool feature. I don't know if you knew about it. 
if I don't know where my mouse pointer is, sometimes it, I lose it on whatever document I'm on. If I hit the control key, I get concentric circles around where my mouse would be. Of course, the mouse disappears on PowerPoint. I'm back over on the web page. You know, for whatever reason, I couldn't see my mouse because it's a vertical beam on the letter W between between. If I can't see that, you know, if I look away and then look back, I can't tell. But if I hit control, now I get these concentric circles around my mouse. That's a really cool feature. Um, I don't know how you would do it on a Mac, but on a PC, and this is the last thing, and then we'll, we'll stop. If I bring up mouse settings and go to additional mouse options, under pointer options, and you can't see that, if I go bring up magnifier, window, another Windows tool, magnifier, hopefully you can see that. I went to the pointer options, and down at the very bottom of the dialog, is show location of pointer when I press the control key. It's probably something hardly anybody knows about, but it's a super awesome feature to have to turn on in case you lose your mouse for mouse sighted mouse users. Again, where's my mouse? I don't know. Oh, there it is. Concentric circles. All right, sorry, I, I get carried away and talk a lot and don't pause for questions. I know we're out of time now, but I am willing to hang around and uh, answer any questions. We do have our captioner for 15 extra minutes. I book them for 15 extra minutes just in case that we have a buffer. So um, there was a question that was put in early by Miguel um, that I wanted to circle back to. Um, Miguel was asking, how picky are you with keyboard padding or patterns, e.g. using the arrow keys additionally to the tab keys for components like tab groups, accordions, submenus, and navigation? Um, do you expect that to work. So when you go in a drop down, would you want to see that you can use the up down arrow keys to navigate in addition to tab? Um, and and if it doesn't work, would you call that a problem? Yeah, that's excellent question. Um, it's more of a usability. I mean, it'd be fantastic if everybody, uh, if you look at, let me just bring this up. There's what's called the authoring practice which is a basically a, a design pattern library. So you mentioned uh, like accordion, or you mentioned the tab. I think you mentioned accordions as well, but let's go to the tab pattern, which has a little icon of, you know, tabs, like tabs on a file folder. It has a list of keyboard interactions that you should implement in order, which is best for the user because now when they go to your page, which has tabs, and they go to somebody else's page, which has tabs, and some other commercial site which has tabs that they're used to the pattern of how to navigate with the keyboard. So it's always best to follow these instructions. You know, tab key does a certain thing, left arrow does a certain key, right arrow, space or enter, home or end key. You know, there's all these different uh, recommendations, strong recommendations on what to do for keyboard support. But if you want to get technical and look at the actual guideline, so 2.1.1 1 .1 is keyboard support. All this says is that all functionality is operable through the keyboard, period. It doesn't say you have to use the right keys. So it doesn't say that you, know, you really should use the arrow keys to navigate through the different tabs on a tab navigator. If you don't, does it fail WCAG? Technically, no, because maybe somebody implemented the tab. Well, that's a poor name the tab key on my keyboard to navigate between the different tabs of the tab navigator. Okay, I can get to it through the keyboard. That's all that's required. Or maybe they, you know, even worse, maybe they implemented it with um, maybe the number keys, maybe one, two, three, four goes to the different tabs. Okay, well, that is a keyboard functionality. It works with the keyboard. So it passes WCAG. It's just from a usability or consistency perspective. So I would not fail that, but when I do accessibility testing, I have a severity for issues. I only use high and medium for my severities that are true WCAG failures. And I'll mark an issue as a low priority if it's more of a usability issue. Like they should fix it. Legally, you might not have to because it's not a technical WCAG failure, but it is something that you should do. But yeah, that's a Great, great question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, I think we kind of do the same thing. I like the flag best practices, but it was interesting if you um, listened to Nick's talk last time, he's like accessibility <laughs> testers should not, at least in, in how he's training the screen reader testers, he's like, we, we flag on WCAG. We don't flag on other things. Yeah. So I think that's and, interesting. And it's very subjective. I might work for one client that says, yeah, tell me everything. I want to know usability stuff. And other people are very strict and say, no, absolutely. We don't care about, well, I won't say we don't care. We don't want usability issues reported in our accessibility testing, even though, you know, and that's unfortunate because usability and accessibility are not separate things. They're, they're not exactly the same either. There's a ton of overlap and you really should not ignore usability because you're focused so much on which criterion do I fail or pass. Yeah, I think I've seen actually there's there's like examples of websites that were intentionally made unusable or quote inaccessible, but don't actually have WCAG failures. I can't remember yeah. what that was. It's kind of like there's one that's like the least accessible website with a 100% Lighthouse score for accessibility. That's, that's what it is. Yep. Yeah. I was gonna... uh, so uh, Dineb had a question. This is going back to when you add the focus. Do you ever use colon not parentheses focus dash visible trick? Hmm. Or do you find that people don't mind seeing that outline on click? Um, so, so when again, that's more of a design. Yeah, that, that's kind of a design thing. Personally, I don't mind seeing outlines around stuff, even when I click on them. It's, it's kind of a reinforcing thing that, all right, I clicked on the right thing. And so I don't mind it. There are some designers that really despise any kind of outline or ring around stuff. So it's a very subjective question answer, right? So I, I don't, for me, I don't, it doesn't bother me. So yeah, no, so I don't, I don't use the not. In our practice, um, the default is that we always have, like we just do, on focus, not like on, what is it? Uh, like on, I don't know, uh, but it's like, it's there even on click, but we do sometimes remove it when we get a lot of pushback from clients. Mm -hmm. So it's only there when it's like focused on or interacted with in a fo like with a keyboard focus versus a click. Um, right. I don't like doing it. I try to talk clients out of it, but sometimes you just decide to pick your battles. <laughs> right, sure. So, yeah. That was the last question that I think we had in the Q&A. I appreciate so much everything that you have shared with us today and um, taking the extra time to be really detailed. It's been great, Glenn, as always. If anyone wanted to follow up with you, what's the best way for them to get oh. a hold of you? Yeah, whoops, that's not the first. I meant that's my first slide. Yeah, if, if you want to get in touch with me, if you had questions, uh, my email address is glenn.walker at gmail.com. And Glenn is spelled with one N. If you spell it with two N's, I don't know who will get it. Somebody will get it, probably, but not me. So G L E N dot Walker, W A L K E R, at gmail.com. If you have questions or any follow-ups to here, or you can post on the meetup uh, comment page as well. Um, if you want to indulge me for a second, there's actually one really cool thing I kind of wanted to show that um, this was on the SEO press page, just uh, based on language, because this is a really cool feature of screen readers. So if anybody's hanging around, yeah. if I go, um, they have this drop down on this page here. Let me bump it up a little bit. So it says English and it has a drop down. If I select it, it says Spanish and French, which first of all, from a design UX perspective, I think those words should be in their native language. So I think it should say Espanol and Francais, and I don't have the accents to pronounce those properly. But you know, instead of having the language written in English, you know, it says Spanish and French, have it in the native language and Secondly, if you do use the native language, make sure you use the language attribute in HTML because that can change the voice or that can change your screen reader voice to a different dialect and a different accent. And it's really, really cool. And let me just show you real quick. Um, 
actually, um, let me get to, uh, sorry, I, don't, I know we're out of done, but I need to get, let's see. We have about four minutes with our captioner and then we'll probably gotcha. need to be done. So I wanted to, I do this just because I want to get the actual Enya Espanol. So instead of Spanish, do Espanol. Center. French to say it's easier to get that code. So instead of French, Francais. Now, if I only do that, that doesn't help me with the screen reader. NVDA speech viewer, meeting control, CO, CO press, right, English button tab. expanded. English list with two items, Espanol link. All right, it's reading Francais those as link. if they were English words, which is not great. But if I use the language attribute. Es English button right. expanded. So I'll take a second. Speech mode so off. So if I go over to Espanol and say Lang equals Spanish, yes. And if I go to French, language equals FR for French. Now, if I go back to my page. Speech mode, see English button collapse expanded. And now if I tab to it. English list with two items. Espanol. Link. Francais. Okay, now we're Link. getting a different dialect and accent because I use the language property in HTML. It is affecting the screen reader. And I think it's just such a cool option. I, that's why I really wanted to show this. Um, Mm -hmm. so we're getting yeah, a different I mean, accent. It's really cool. The other thing that it'll do too, if you use something with Asian characters, so we built a website where they had some content in Korean, is it mm -hmm. actually impacts the styles of those characters. Mm -hmm. So they look more like brushstroke when you give them a lang attribute of whatever it was for Korean. <laughs> um, right. So it is very interesting. Well, and I think this is a good point too on. Uh, usability versus accessibility because that's not an accessibility failure right to have them in that language but it would certainly be easier for someone who maybe needs to switch to that language to see the language title in that language uh yes and no originally when it had that language written in french when it said spanish or french so it's written in english that is not an accessibility issue however yeah. if they said espanol or francais and they did not specify the lang attribute it would be an accessibility issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you are correct. Originally, it is not. Well, thank you so much. Again, we really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming and sticking around with us.